Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chatham House. If I could ask you to take your seats, please. I'm sorry to uh, be starting a little bit late, as you can imagine. Um, the president has a very busy schedule at the moment, and we're just delighted to be able to welcome uh, President Enrique Peña Nieto to Chatham House um, today. Um, there is great interest, as you will appreciate, President, uh, in the program that you have set for Mexico and your pact for Mexico with other parties, uh, the opportunity for a reform uh, process that holds out great promise for Mexico and one that obviously you're right at the front end of, um, but one that we will have the opportunity to discuss with you as you uh, make your presentation, at least the title I have here, hopefully it will correspond to the one that you will give, uh, Mexico's Moment Structural Reforms democratic governance and global engagement. And I know you've been involved as well on some international issues during your visit here uh, in London. Um, Chatham House, I would say ourselves, we're just starting to discover Mexico to a certain extent. Perhaps we've been a little um, slow on this front. My predecessor as director of Chatham House, Victor Bulma Thomas, um, has led our work uh, on the United States and continues uh, to, on, on Latin America and the United States and continues to help us in that process. Andres Rosenthal, a former foreign minister of your country, is a member of our panel of senior advisors, and we're delighted with the support he's been giving us. And I think in our work here at Chatham House on energy, on health, on nuclear proliferation issues, which I know you're interested in as well, um, and on drugs and organized crime, where we uh, benefited from the input of your former ambassador, Eduardo Medina Mora, who's now gone to the uh, US. Uh, and we look forward to continuing our co collaboration with Ambassador Estivil as well. So we're delighted to have you here for this purpose. Let me say that as well, uh, on some of the practical uh, aspects, this meeting is on the record. This discussion is on the record. Many people think of any meeting at Chatham House is under the Chatham House rule, but this is on the record. Um, there will be simultaneous translation provided. You have um, uh, translation equipment on your seats. Um, and uh, Channel 1, I believe, is the U, uh, for UK. And uh, for English, uh, Channel 2 for Spanish. And this is also being webcast. The webcast, for those of you who are following this, will be in what you hear in the room. So I'm speaking English. You will shortly be hearing some Spanish. Um, and then you will hear questions in a mix of the two. We will have up on our website later on a translated version for those who would like to take advantage of that process. Let me just say a couple of quick words uh, about the president before he uh, takes the stage here. Um, he is a president who I think uh, many people have noted did his education both in law, um, in uh, MBA and business administration in Mexico. Unlike uh, many leaders of the country who've taken advantage of uh, the educational facilities to the north uh, of the border. But he's somebody who got into politics very early uh, from uh, the beginning and particularly in politics in the state of Mexico where over time he moved forward to become Secretary of Administration. Uh, he was elected a representative of the 13th district. He was co coordinator of the parliamentary group of his party, the uh, PRI, the Institutional Revolutionary Party. But in 2005, he uh, succeeded after a tough campaign to the position of the governor of the state of Mexico, a position he then held for six years. And from there, he went straight on, uh, announced his candidacy for the presidency. And after the presidential uh, campaign, uh, he took up the presidency in December, having been elected back in July of last year. So, um, Mr. President, we're delighted you would come to Chatham House to share your thoughts at this pivotal moment for Mexico. We look forward to your remarks. We look forward to Q&A afterwards. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a privilege and an honor for me to join you here at Chatham House. Chatham House has a long-standing tradition as a space to share ideas. And I'm very glad to share with a distinguished audience the developments of Mexico. My administration began six months ago. Therefore, I'm very glad to share with you the political climate of Mexico. In Mexico, we have consolidated our democracy. And 
from a democ democratic basis, we are making great strides to make development and progress thrive in Mexico. I would like to thank Robert Niblet for his hospitality, for his introductory words. And without further ado, please allow me to begin with my presentation. And after my presentation, I will be willing to answer your questions. I'm very grateful that we have distinguished personalities from the academia, from the diplomatic corps that have attended this lecture. I'm very grateful that you are here, and I'm very grateful that I can share these issues with you. This is space, there is no doubt, reflects a keen interest to learn about the transformation that it's going on in my country. I understand that this is an invitation to acknowledge the commitment that we all Mexicans have to build a more productive, modern, and developed country. For a long time, Mexico's potential has been seen as a possibility. And therefore, we are making steps forward to transform our our country. In spite of major progress in macroeconomics, in spite of the stability of our institutions and how vigorous our democracy is, Mexico has not been able to translate all of these achievements in a better standard of living for its population. There are great challenges to overcome crime and violence that have affected some communities in their national territory. Peace and peace of mind has been affected. We are a country that grows at two different speeds. There is a Mexico based on progress and development, but there is another Mexico that is in backwardness. Today, we are still a nation where a great deal of the population lacks the basic conditions to enjoy their rights fully, which is the core goal of my administration. We are working on it. We are working to see the rights enshrined in our Constitution fully exercised and become a reality for every single Mexican. There is a great deal of Mexicans who try to make ends meet. They are concerned about the lack of jobs. They are concerned because the country has not grown enough in the last three decades. And specifically, based on this outlook and the wish of all Mexicans to change the situation, it is that today we have a historic opportunity to make domestic transformations and consolidate our country as an emerging economic power. I am certain that the ground is set to achieve it. And therefore, we believe that this is Mexico's moment. It is true that we don't have a majority in Congress. Today, unlike other times in a recent history, there is a broad agreement in terms of what must be done to overcome challenges and by that trigger the enormous potential that Mexico has. There is a broad consensus. We cannot waste our time, and Mexico cannot longer put off vital reforms. We have the support of citizens, specialists, civil society organizations to materialize the relevant reforms that the country needs. We Mexicans are ready and have decided to perfect its democracy. It is solid in terms of its institutions and electoral processes, but still, this has not been translated yet in a democracy that shows more results, results that truly impact the life of Mexicans and shows true benefits. We have realized as well that this is not an issue restricted to Mexico. This is an issue that we see in different countries of the world. 
we see that uh, having plurality in the political arena sometimes results in a polarization. That is why uh, by acknowledging plurality and how diverse we are, the natural disagreements that happen in the political arena amongst political forces and specifically among social sectors by acknowledging this natural trade of democracy, we have resolved to make great strides towards change and transformation that would make our economic development and social development thrive. At the beginning of my administration, we have clearly pointed out our main goals in which we will target our efforts. First of all, I clearly stated that uh, we wanted to give Mexicans peace and peace of mind. We want a peaceful Mexico, and therefore we have instituted a new security policy specifically to give peace of mind to all Mexicans. Secondly, we want an inclusive Mexico, a Mexico that changes the trend of poverty and inequality. I should say that uh, this is not restrictive to Mexico as well. It is a trend that we see in Latin America. There is a major inequality gap. And thirdly, our third national goal that my administration is working on is to ensure that Mexico has quality education specifically quality education that provides new generations with the adequate tools to be part of a world that uh, demands capabilities, a world with strong competition. We want Mexicans to have the right skills to step into a quite competitive labor market. And fourthly, we want a prosperous Mexico. And what does this mean? By making structural changes, we want to see more economic growth in Mexico, growth that is sustained and broad. And there, there, therefore, we will pay close attention and we will create policies to make sure that this level of sustained economic growth happens. We need to be more productive. I've just stated it. It is true that in terms of macroeconomics, Mexico has very favorable figures. It is true that we haven't grown enough. We haven't generated the number of jobs needed in the country, and especially we haven't been able to broaden opportunities for each Mexican. What is the reason for this? In the last three decades, productivity in Mexico has dropped. And therefore, in all of our policies and actions to spur economic growth, we want to increase productivity. We want to do that and also to make it more democratic. And that means that productivity must be reflected and seen in every single region of the country, not only in a few ones so that growth in our country is uniform and standardized all around the country. And it should not be a privilege given to just a few companies. It should be extended to cover specifically small and medium-sized enterprises. And for that, we have specific policies to make SMEs more productive. Our fifth goal. Mexico cannot be absent of what is going on around the world. Mexico needs to be globally engaged to champion the priority causes of the world, peace and prosperity, namely. And therefore, Mexico has a clear understanding of its role globally. We want to, to advocate for free trade. We want to protect investments that reach Mexican soil. We want to be a solidarious nation that champions peace and support to the international community. 
These are the five goals that the new Mexican administration is working on. Here you see a responsible vision, an achievable vision. This is the common purpose that unites us. This go beyond political interests. To make this a reality, the day after I took office on December the 2nd, and I want to publicly recognize the will of the main political forces in my country. Due to that, we were able to agree on a major national agreement that we have decided to call the Pact for Mexico. This is a political consensus that gave rise to a new stage of our democratic life, a stage that is characterized by dialogue, understanding, and commitment to lead the changes and transformations that our country needs. The importance of this agreement lies in the fact that the top political parties of Mexico, the National Action Party, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, and the Democratic Revolutionary Party, along with my administration, we have decided to prioritize our agreements and put all of those in paper. We have agreed on a work agenda based on 95 items. We have made a 50% progress based on the reforms that we have been able to pass in the first six months. Due to this support, we were able to pass the labor reform that makes the labor market more flexible. Hiring of young individuals is expedited. With no previous experience, are now joining the labor market. We have passed an education reform, which emphasizes the third goal that I've already shared with you. Mexico needs quality education. We have also the competition reform to set the ground for better competition in the area of telecommunications and other sectors of our economy. The telecommunications reform favors competition in the telecom sector and also makes sure that Mexicans have better broadcasting, broadband services that eventually will allow us to be more competitive and access is warranted. And among the services included, we will have better prices and more competition in terms of the supply of services provided. In terms of the Pact for Mexico, I must say that we see how mature our democracy is. It is a clear sign that uh, there is civility amongst its members. Together, we have decided that the pact and its agenda goes beyond the political climate. The spirit of unity, clear leadership, and political will to prioritize the interests of the country above anything else have set the ground to make progress in transformational reforms that I have already mentioned. And I must say that we still have ahead of us an ambitious work agenda that we have to materialize and we're working on it. Besides the reforms that I have just shared, the education reform, the telecommunications reform, and the, the competition reform, we have also set a clear path to reach important reforms, namely a financial reform that will incentivate lending specifically for small and medium-sized enterprises and as well for all Mexicans. I just said it. Mexican financial institutions are solid institutions, but regretfully, the level of credit compared to our GDP is very low in contrast to what we see in more developed countries and other countries that have a similar level of development as we have in Mexico. We have to incentivate lending as a lever for economic development. We need to make lending more accessible for Mexicans. 
and we need to make lending more affordable. This is the scope of the financial reform, and I need to make a clear distinction from the tax reform, that it's also part of the Pact for Mexico. The tax reform will be aimed, and this is a, a topic that we will discuss in the upcoming weeks and months once the next regular sessions begin in September. We will work on a tax reform that uh, will be based on fair and simplified taxes that analyzes the tax collecting powers of different levels of government and that also follows a progressive mechanism. That is to say, if you earn more, you must pay more. And eventually, this will make the state government more capable to address social needs. Also, we are working on an energy reform. We also have based this reform on major agreements between political forces and the government of Mexico. First of all, hydrocarbons must be owned by the state. The state-owned oil company Pemex must be ruled by the government. But there is a need to make it more productive and extend its net capacity, its infrastructure, to explore new energy sources. We need to change its scope so it's specific, specific elements like gas, natural gas is cheaper and that electricity is cheaper as well. We need to make it more affordable. And in order to achieve this goal, it is of the utmost importance to advance an energy reform that allows private parties' participation to extend our country's production capabilities. We also have planned a political reform, which is also part of the pact, and we're working on it. The political reform will make governments more efficient, and we will work to make citizens a priority. In this reform, we will work on three major areas. The Pact for Mexico is analyzing how we can do the relevant changes to make citizens participate differently. In the Constitution, we have nonpartisan candidacies, popular consultations, and citizens' participations. We are addressing electoral processes, and thirdly, the Parties Act, and we're going to reform the, the debate of re-elections, coalition governments, and the political reform for Mexico City. As you can see, the scope of the political reform show how much agreement we have between political forces, my administration, in order to carry out substantial reforms and structural changes. Ladies and gentlemen, when we say that this is Mexico's moment, it is because today we're taking advantage to the full of this historic opportunity to embark on a national transformation which is thorough and triggers an overarching development for our country. We have full macroeconomic, macroeconomic stability, solid institutions, and a broad social and political consensus to support transformations needed in our country. Plurality and legitimate ideological differences far from being a stumbling block, have been very useful to foster the changes needed for the benefit of all Mexicans. The circumstances are optimal to move and transform Mexico forward. Mexico is optimistic and hopeful in terms of the changes that are, have been happening to foster growth, enhance social development, and to create more opportunities for all Mexicans. I am confident that the work done during this first six months are a clear sign of the support and will coming from political forces and the government of Mexico. There is the will to go beyond political climate. 
and by this we can open the door to the changes and consensus needed to transform our country. The changes achieved so far are encouraging. And in the upcoming months, Mexico will advance structural changes that eventually make it happen that in the following years, Mexico has better social development and economic growth. I believe that the step forward that Mexico has given with the Pact for Mexico is a clear sign that in a democracy, it is possible to obtain results and benefits for the population. Democracy should not end in the ballots. In a democracy, we should open spaces up for dialogue, for agreements, and specifically to work on major goals together because there is an agreement in that area. The Pact for Mexico is a relevant component of our democracy. More than being a negotiating table, it represents a shared vision, and I must underscore this statement, shows the level of maturity and vision of political forces and the government of Mexico together to work together to advance changes and create the structural changes and transformations that would give us the Mexico that we want. That is why we say it in those terms. This is Mexico's moment because we're experiencing it. This is not rhetoric. The presence of Mexico in different scenarios is the result of passing reforms that have materialized already and there are more upcoming reforms. I believe and I hope that the reforms that are working on materialize for the benefit of Mexico and for the benefit of all Mexicans. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share my mind with you. I have shared the recent developments in my country, and uh, I'll be very grateful to receive your questions if there are any. Thank you very much. The labor market is huge on competition, uh, on education reform. You've still got finance, energy, tax, laws for the political parties. This is, this is a big agenda. Just as, as a front question, you do you think that you're going to have to step up to constitutional reform in order to be able to get any of these particular items through, whether it be in the energy space or maybe some of the political reform? Is, are you going to have to face that issue of how big a majority, I suppose, you have to be able to push through constitutional reform? Or do you think you can get most of this done, this agenda, without having to address that fundamental issue? I have two questions with you uh, at the front end, looking through this program that you talked about. You discussed this about being a two-speed Mexico somewhat at the moment, and you need to pull the two speeds closer um, together. And you uh, also noted that you've got going already on the labor market issues, on competition, uh, on education reform. You've still got finance, energy, tax, laws for the political parties. This is, this is a big agenda. Just as, as a front question, do you think that you're going to have to step up to constitutional reform in order to be able to get any of these particular items through, whether it be in the energy space or maybe some of the political reform, is, are you going to have to face that issue of how big a majority, I suppose, you have to be able to push through constitutional reform? Or do you think you can get most of this done, this agenda, without having to address that fundamental issue? First and foremost, let me share with you that the Pact for Mexico has created a consensus and an agreement setting between political forces and the government of Mexico. What we have set out to do based on this agenda is to make structural, deep and thorough changes in the items that we have agreed upon. The reforms that have t taken place already, namely education, competition, and telecommunications are constitutional changes in a very expedited fashion have passed a complex process to make it happen. We have made adjustments that uh, have not only been passed by the Congress of the Union, but have also been passed by the legislatures at a state level. Altogether, 
are part of the permanent Congress that we have at both levels in Mexico. In terms of what we have ahead of us, well, the pact would have to assess what will come next. It is clear that we need substantial changes. We don't, we, we don't want changes that will end up at the sidelines. Probably some secondary laws, some rules will have to be changed, but we need impactful and changes with a broader scope. We are fully convinced, all of us who are part of the Pact for Mexico, is that every item covered needs to be substantial, needs to result in a structural change to expedite growth in our country. We have to cover the energy sector, the tax sector. That would be agreed together. We are not setting limits. We are not setting limits either to make it a constitutional reform or changes to secondary legislation. We are willing to move forward but based on a, an agreement. I'd like to take one more question. Um, you mentioned your fifth uh, plank was the international. And that Mexico needs to play its role internationally. Uh, you're a member of the G20. I believe that while you've been here in London, you've been doing some work on non-proliferation, on nuclear issues. I think, uh, 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 could you just say a word or two what you would prioritize as being a characteristic of a more internationally engaged Mexico? What would you put at the top of the list. We may have other questions that are specific here, but what would you want to, to, to pull out as being distinctive about Mexico's international role? First of all, Mexico needs to address domestic issues first, and by that we will be able to have more presence and to cooperate in the region more actively. What is our aim? We need to incentivate trade with other regions in the world. And by that, we are part of several partnerships, the Pacific Partnership with Peru, Colombia, and Chile. And also, other countries have joined up and have shown their interest to be part of this partnership. And that would create a broader partnership between our countries and Asia, TPP is a Trans-Pacific Partnership composed by 12 countries and negotiations are underway to reach the TPP. And we also want more participation with Latin American countries, specifically with Central America and the Caribbean because we are neighbors. And through cooperation, we want to see more development in these countries. And based on Mexico's successful stories, we would like to share our expertise with these countries. And uh, allow me to touch on a topic that was addressed yesterday during the G8 summit in the summit's declaration, out of the 10 items undersigned by the parties, four touch on global cooperation to prevent tax avoidance and evasion by global companies. Mexico is part of this endeavor, and Mexico is the first party that has joined this effort. We have an agreement with the U.S. to exchange tax and fiscal information. This will be an automatic exchange. And we want to be part of an agreement that five countries of, the Euro of Europe, France, Europe, Spain, Italy, and Germany have joined up forces to exchange automatic information we are waiting for the response to be part of this agreement. And in my opinion, this will have results in terms of how many more countries participate. Let me open up questions. and get some questions in. I've seen quite a few hands have caught my eye before I uh, got going here. So um, let me uh, start, first of all, with the gentleman who's there. And then if you could wait for the microphone, please, to come. I have a couple here, a gentleman here. And just let us know who you are. Sure. Yes, please. Um, Emil Kyrgios, Liberal International. 
And I would like to touch upon the global engagement, and I'm very happy to see my ex-colleague, State Secretary Condi Rice here from the time when I was State Secretary in the Macedonian government. The question is, um, your comment on the proposal of your Guatemalan colleague on the war of drugs. The second question is, would you receive Capriles in Mexico City? Thank you. Sobre... Could you please repeat the Guatemalan portion of your question? Or Molina for having a new approach to the war on drugs. Sobre este tema en particular. In that particular topic, let me tell you, we have close ties with Guatemala, a neighbor country to Mexico. We have talked about further cooperation, but specifically in that area, Mexico has clearly stated its approach. Mexico is not in favor of legalizing drugs. We are not convinced that this is the best way to reduce the levels of crime and violence that take place in our countries. However, we are for, and I must insist, and we must raise our voice that as soon as possible, we have a broad debate about this issue. And whatever consensus is reached about the new policies to address this issue, well, this can't be decided by a handful. It demands more participation. It demands a hemispheric decision. And I believe that uh, it, the decision made by the U.S. is vital. It is a very important consumer. It's a transit country for most of the drugs. And in, in terms of Molina's approach, and this is an approach shared by President Santos in Colombia, is very clear. We are not in favor, but it is certain that we must have a broad debate. We must reach a consensus, and we need to redefine how we are going to address this issue hemispherically. In terms of Venezuela, no. It is clear that uh, Mexico has ac acknowledged the newly formed government in Venezuela, and we cannot participate in domestic issues. We are not going to make a stand in terms of domestic issues. This is our decision. I'm in there. I'm coming down here. Uh, yeah. First there. Yeah. You also. Eh, muchas gracias, Presidente, por el discurso. Y Thank you very much, President, for the lecture and for the courage and vision needed to embark on all the activities that you have shared with us. My name is Jose. I'm a member of Chatham House. <laughs> That'll do. That's fine. Keep going. <laughs> You've mentioned that uh, you have reached a consensus with political forces, and that is the springboard for your reforms. And I would like to know if from other stakeholders, are, is there reluctancy from monopolies, from the private sector? Would you say that such levels of reluctancy, if they're present, would delay the reforms that you're working on? It's natural, and it's expected with substantial and structural changes, there will be reluctance. And the most important thing is that more than hearing dissident opposing voices coming from certain sectors that show a clear sign, are a clear sign of freedom. And the consensus that we have reached between political forces and the government of Mexico shows that in a very smoothly and expedited fashion, we have materialized reforms that are major, that are thorough in all the areas that I have covered. And notwithstanding the fact that we are respectful towards them, specifically, the Pact for Mexico has opened its door to the voices that disagree. And there might be disagreements with some of its portions, but the Pact for Mexico has opened up a space to listen to the voices that disagree. We have been very clear in terms of all, all the areas that we cover. 
we do have, and we will still have spaces for dialogue to address the content of the pact. And we have had an exchange with these voices that disagree, and they have the right to be heard by the members of the pact, and we have done it. And uh, in any democracy, it is a prerequisite. And we need to build our decisions in a consensus on the decisions of the majority. There, that is the prerequisite for structural changes. And we are not aiming for unanimity. We need support. We need majority support. But in a democracy, the consensus, majorities must prevail. Right. Gentlemen, here first, please. Uh, Jake Arnold, uh, former member of parliament and advisor to first. As the largest Hispanic country in Latin America, what is the Mexican perspective on the divisions created in the region by the late President Chavez and the, his successor regime? What is the likely, in your view, the likely effect in terms of stability on the region that could happen, not least if they were to withdraw their subsidies they're paying to countries like Cuba and Nicaragua? Mire, México ha mantenido los... Listen, Mexico has always been, and my administration will always be respectful towards domestic decisions made in foreign countries, and we will uh, we will be a champion to find a peaceful solution of disagreements and disputes, and obviously we are willing to build strategic partnerships for development with the countries with which we share and with whom we have concurrences, where we have the same principles and values, meaning rule of law, respect to democracy, respect to international law. And with these countries, obviously, we will have a higher level of understanding and stronger dialogues, but we will always be respectful towards domestic issues. Okay, the gentleman, uh, Victor. Mexico's achievements within the pact are impressive, specifically after the first six months. Probably we could talk about the risks. May the pact survive because there are other parties that are in a undergoing a split, not your party, but the opposition. Listen, the pact is not free from tensions, from disagreements, from brawls. In my opinion, that is the most natural thing in a democracy. But we have seen support and willingness to address disagreements, and we have seen always a democratic exercise in different electoral processes in Mexico. 14 states out of the 32 will have an election. We will have new, new mayors new city councillors, and one governor will be elected. That is the attitude, but I must insist. Political forces have set up priority, and that is to reach an agreement, and that is to fulfill and materialize the agreements that are part of the Pact for Mexico. But what would be the lifespan of the Pact for Mexico? It is difficult to say. First, we have to address the items containing the Pact for Mexico, and that is its mandate. It's 95 items that we have to address, and so far we have covered practically 50% of what we have set out to achieve. And the most relevant item I would like to highlight I would like to highlight how important the pact is in our demo democracy. 
more than triggering a polarization and triggering differences. This is a unique space created by Mexicans with maturity, civility, and with a strong will to go beyond natural differences. We are a plural context, but we have prioritized agreements, and I would like to to end up by saying, and I believe that I have answered your question so far, what we have sent to Congress for its review for a debate and to enrich the bills with their contribution. All of our proposals have been discussed over thoroughly. These are not just bills presented by the executive branch. Of course, this is our own initiative, but we have incorporated approaches and contributions coming from the political forces represented in the PENT for Mexico. And therefore, we have made our proposals more stronger. Let's see if I can squeeze a, a few more questions in. Just as I said, we go five minutes over if, if people can uh, bear with this. Um, I have a gentleman here and a gentleman there. So two questions. We'll take two and two, if that's all right, Mr. President. Okay. And then you can banish your time. And then I have a lady who's been waiting very patiently there, um, and the young guy's been waiting there. I thought that it was. So, well, yes, please. It's Randall Dillard, Managing Director of MindGate. Um, my question, um, Mr. President, is you mentioned fiscal reform, and you also mentioned the elections and governorships. Um, are you extending the fiscal reform that you did in the state of Mexico um, um, to other governorships? and in particular the municipalities, which are probably needing more reform than those in the Ministry of Finance or the state of Mexico. Okay, so pass the microphone back. So about municipalities and governorships, whether you can push your reform program into there as well. Yeah. Let me just to Mariano, answer that. Hold on one second. Because exactly. the first, yeah. Um, yeah, I've got it. I think it's on. Should Standard one? Yeah. Try that and see. Otherwise, it's to see it. if not, it's channel two, and I'll put it on for you. Uh, I, I it's a, one, is it for Spanish? Okay. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, second question. Do you want to hear the first question again, Mr. President? Yes, I please. would like to refer the first. Could you ask that question again, just again? Just uh, yes. Nice sh distinct to short. Does your fiscal reform plans include other governorships and municipalities in, in the fiscal reforms? Um, uh, you were very good at putting the state of Mexico's house in order. Um, other governorships probably require some revenue rules, and the municipalities might benefit. And I wondered whether your plans extend um, um, and tax reforms to those areas. Okay, and the pass the microphone behind you, please. Mariano Machain from Amnesty International. Presidente, considera Mr. President, would you say that uh, how you have addressed human rights issues in your country, have you done enough? Last two weeks. About your first question, the fiscal reform that uh, we're working on considers fiscal powers granted to state governments. And their powers will give them the possibility to define their own tax collection mechanisms. That is what I meant. I am not advancing changes at a municipal or a state level. Basically, with the powers granted, we need to evaluate if the states have enough tax collections capabilities that they themselves will decide. In terms of human rights, our commitment is clear. Since the beginning of my administration and the current climate, when we took office, well, we have paid close attention to this social demand. There are social sectors that have been affected by it in in the past. Some human rights violations happened, and this is linked to the strategy that we have implemented in the area of security. We are emphasizing human rights. 
we have seen major breakthroughs in human rights fulfillment. The number of, of reports of human rights violations have dropped compared to past figures, and we have created a special office in the federal government to address all the reports related to human rights, and I hope that this is enough to fulfill this commitment that my government has made. And in the presentation of the security plan, I said it, we are willing to improve. We are assessing the strategies that are being implemented. Oh, Very question. I apologize to all those people who put their hands up, but I've, I've, I've had to choose the one I did. The lady waiting here, and then the gentleman back there. Good morning, Mr. President. I'm Abril Perez. I'm a Mexican, and I live and work in London in the financial sector. And as a Mexican myself, living abroad, I have seen that the, my friends, co-workers, are concerned about how safe our country is to work, to travel, to live, and invest. Could you elaborate on your social welfare reform and, if it's possible, some deadlines and how radical that reform Thank would you. be. Last question. Uh, Stephen Eisenhammer from Reuters. Um, you mentioned the importance of energy reform. I was wondering if you might be able to give a little bit more detail about what that reform might look like. Um, will foreign companies be able to take joint ventures with Pemex and have a stake in the oil that's in the ground? Two good questions to finish with, I think. Well, not so fácil. That's why it's always the last question, you know. That, uh, <laughs> about the first one, the security strategy highlights and pays close attention to reduce violence. Regretfully, violence has emerged in sensitive areas of the country. I must say that crime rates happens in 196 out of the 4,400 municipalities that our country has. 2,400. It's 196 municipalities are of the 2,400 municipalities. That doesn't mean that we are downplaying this issue. It is one of the five goals that uh, our country, uh, my government, is addressing. We need to bring peace and peace of mind back to Mexico. We have encouraging figures so far during the first few months in which the security strategy has been implemented. We work on prevention, capacity building, effective coordination between state and federal governments. We're starting to see a new light shed over the figures. We see a drop in homicides in our country. If we keep this trend up, we would be walking the right path. I have made an invitation to assess this strategy in one year's time. But let me tell you, ma'am, that we are on the right path. We will reduce violence, which is a sensitive issue, and we're working on municipalities where violence is concentrated. This is where violence is happening. I believe that Mexico has beauties and wonders to show more and this goes beyond the regretful acts of violence that have happened in specific areas of our country. It is a safe country, yes, and it is a country where you can invest. Now, allow me to address the financial reform. Excuse me. The, the, the last question no, was no, about, oh, sorry, about the last financial reform. Okay, I'll talk about the last question. Just focus on the last question, I think, on the... Uh, I've already touched on that. We want to give PMEX more capabilities. 
and whatever change happens will be based on an agreement of political forces and the government of Mexico. The state must own hydrocarbons. The state must rule over Pemex, but we need to extend its capabilities and it is clear that in the process to revamp and transform Pemex, we need to open up to the private sector. There is no doubt that this is one of our goals and uh, it is within the scope of our work. And I must underscore and highlight the following. We are not in the process of privatizing Pemex. Some think that we are in the process of privatizing Pemex. PMX. On the contrary, I must insist, and I've said it once and again, the state will own hydrocarbons in Mexico, will own oil, but we need to expand its capabilities. PEMEX in itself has no resources enough to generate more infrastructure and to generate more energy. It needs more resources. And I've said it, if we want affordable gas, if we want to make sure that utilities are cheaper, and if we want better production levels in our country, we need to improve our gen energy production. And therefore, we need to open up to private participation through mechanisms that have been tested in other countries of the world that the state owning hydrocarbons still have opened up to this opportunity. Mr. President, you've, you've taken a, a lot of questions uh, at the end of what I know is already um, a busy trip, but um, you're six months into this presidency, a large agenda. Uh, I hope we'll be able to get you back and invite you back to Chatham House maybe in a year or two's time where some of these answers to these questions will be connected to some of the results I know you and your colleagues hope to achieve. But thank you very much for giving us such a full uh, set of answers and comments. If I could ask people to please remain in their seats uh, to let the President uh, depart and head upstairs. Um, but please, first of all, give a very strong hand to the President of Mexico, Enrico Peña Nieto.